Jesus Christ was born, the scriptures say, around 2020 years ago, at the same time that Caesar Augustus, the gospel tells us, was Rome's first emperor and one of its longest and most accomplished. Uh, history tells us that Caesar Augustus ruled the entire world around the vast Mediterranean Sea from the south where Egypt and North Africa is all the way up to the Black Sea and then over it into the borders of Scotland. Uh, when he ruled the empire as trophies, he went down into Egypt and he took giant obelisks from pink granite uh, from pagan Egypt that were carved long, long ago, perhaps when Moses and the chosen people were in Egypt. Caesar Augustus called his reign, his long reign, the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, the Roman peace, because the whole world was in some sense at peace. The borders were protected, everyone is stable, there were no more invasions. And he celebrated his world peace by using those nice obelisks to adorn the temples of Rome for the Roman pagan gods. They called Augustus during his reign a new title, the Princeps Pacis in Latin, which means the Prince of Peace for the Pax Romana. Now we know Jesus Christ, as the Gospel tells us, was born in Bethlehem during this Pax Romana, and an emperor's census is meant to keep things together. But after three centuries of Roman rule, a Christian emperor appeared on the scene named Constantine, and he would once more move those famous obelisks. This time he placed the nicest one outside a church in Rome. It was the first church in the West dedicated to the mother of Jesus Christ. If you're in Rome, it's called St. Mary the Major, the Greater. And inside that basilica, there is a shrine right below the main altar, this entrenched, beautiful building. And in the shrine, one can see a small, decrepit, simple piece of barnyard furniture. It is the manger into which Mary placed her newborn son the night he was born. That was his first cradle. But the obelisk Constantine placed tells you about that outside the basilica. At its base pedestal, it has an inscription in Latin. And it says this very interesting. The obelisk, you might say, speaks to you in the first person. It says, I was carved to celebrate the gods of Egypt. Caesar Augustus, who called himself the Prince of Peace, brought me to Rome to honor his pagan gods. But now here I stand to guard the manger in which the true Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, was born. The year of our Lord now, 2020, that's a long time since the birth, it's about to come to an end next week. It has been perhaps one of the most depressing and confusing years in more than a thousand years. One could hardly think of a parallel to all the confusing things we've experienced in 12 months. We had a conflicted election year, a lot of competition there, shootings, riots, racist threats, statues torn down, all kinds of negative events on the daily news that seem to obscure us from the joys of daily life. The great cloud then of the pandemic we've had for almost a year, nine and a half months here, it hovers over the entire globe for a very long time, instilling a still vague fear, a threat to all. And of course, face masks have become the new uniform of the whole human race. For all these reasons and for other causes, people become very restless, annoyed, and depressed. There is very little external peace, it seems, in the world at this hour. And for many, many people, there is very little internal peace within them, less hope for many that the new year would improve. For all of us gathered here this sacred night, whether we are physically present in this holy church, the hall adjacent, or through the live stream from home in distant places, no matter what we are experiencing right now, this event we're experiencing here is about good news, a gospel just proclaimed. For the Prince of Peace, the real Prince of Peace, born of Mary this night, is no longer found in his manger 
in that basilica in Rome. He traded his cradle long ago for a cross much later in life. And there's meaning in both those symbols. He convinced and has convinced the world, though, in his lifetime of how to find true peace in this world. A peace that is not temporary, a peace that will last, a peace that's not imposed by the force of arms from outside of us. When Cicero was a Roman senator, just before Caesar Augustus took over the empire, he debated in the Senate of Rome one day with his opponent, Julius Caesar, and he said that the Roman army has brought peace on earth because every time we destroy a city and level the enemy, we make a desert and we call it peace. But we want something that doesn't seek peace by a violent means, for it's not really peace at all. We want a cure also for our internal restlessness that's within ourselves as we see these disasters around us. So part of the solution is to look at the saints and there came a few centuries after Augustus Caesar, another Augustus, his name was Augustine, Saint Augustine, a very brilliant young man, highly educated, wealthy, but despite his popularity and all those other gifts he enjoyed, he was very restless for years in himself. His brilliant mind, his philosopher's mind could not discover meaning in life. He was seeking inner peace for many, many years. But eventually, because of the prayers of his own mother, who was a Catholic, and his great mentor in Milan, Ambrose, the bishop up there, he began to discover the inner peace comes from a person, not from a philosophy or an ideology. It comes from Christ, the Son of God and Son of Mary, who somehow continued to live in the midst of the world, despite all the distractions, Christ himself, and Augustine realized that could be true of him too. He would later describe his discovery of the true Prince of Peace and how it healed him and gave him stability in a very changing world when he wrote his last great work called his Confessions. It's his autobiography. He started with a very short prayer that tells it all for us tonight. O oh Lord, my heart is restless, and it shall not ever rest until at last it rests within you. And that was the cause and source of his conversion and the engine and motivation behind his greater works as a leader in the church, despite the caving in and destruction of the empire he once enjoyed. We say that we came here tonight to this late midnight type mass we came to celebrate Christmas, and it's true, that's why we're here, and that's why people are viewing it. What we really are saying, though, by being present here, is that this. We have come here because we, too, know, like Augustine, where to find peace. It's not an emotion. Peace is a person. It's a man who was born into this world and taught us how he overcame the world no matter how dark or grave the world can become. So we can say with Augustine and so many others before us, we have found Jesus as our true peace on earth. We know with joy that he is the world's only hope for meaning. It's only hope for lasting peace, the world's only hope for a true and authentic sense of justice, especially in the law-making institutions of the world and our own country. Justice in human affairs all comes from God's revelation to us. Jesus, then, is the only hope for the world's salvation. And once Augustine rooted himself in that, all the restlessness disappeared. We also talk about how this Jesus, who lived long ago, can still be providing us this sense of peace, which is himself. How does he give us himself? The gospel tells us in the census that uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city or its village where the lofty King David came as a young shepherd boy. It was there that David was chosen to be king while still a youth. Jesus came from Bethlehem and the word Bethlehem in the Hebrew language is translated the house of bread. Jesus then from the house of bread 
has transformed himself into our bread of life. So we celebrate the gift of peace. We do it through his great gift of himself in the Eucharist, in this Christmas liturgy. Because despite the fact that we love to give gifts to others or even receive gifts from our family and friends, tonight is the night when Jesus emphasizes he's giving us a gift. The gift of himself, the gift of his own life a sharing in his body and blood, and through that a promise to share fully in the endless life of his resurrection. Such a gift we experience as peace, fortified by that, we can overcome anything. We can withstand anything as we watch the world go by. So 2021 is approaching. We pray fervently that the vaccine now being distributed will produce lasting effects of healing in people. And once more, human science, research, and ingenuity, I believe prompted by God's spirit, will stabilize us and return us to a good normality. But during these nine or 10 months when we felt so isolated, locked down, sheltering in place, removed from our usual social acquaintances of our families, our travel, our friends, many too from their employments, we will find that we have survived. We've overcome it somehow. We have not lost our faith. And because of that, we have not lost the inner peace that can only come from God. And that gift we celebrate this night. And we pray that it will not simply be an annual rediscovery of it, but a daily discovery of the presence of Christ, even in our midst, seeing us, watching us, protecting us, and working within us so that we too, with him, will overcome the world and whatever darkness it tends to bring.